Uh, Nora Gold is a, a scholar and a writer and an activist. She has uh, many hats, many beautiful hats. <laughs> um, she's a scholar uh, in women's studies and in antisem anti studies of antisemitism. She's now at the University of Toronto in the Center for um, Women's Studies in Education. I don't know if that's women studying education or people <laughs> studying women in education. Yeah, it's but everything. It's everything. It's always, yeah. And uh, she's also, as I said, an activist. She started uh, J Space Canada uh, to uh, fight uh, against uh, anti Israeli sentiment or doctrine in, in Canada. She's also a writer. And um, so you can find her on the web in different capacities. She also has her own website, noragold.com. Uh, if you want more, so thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Please, you're welcome. Thank you. I'll go back around. Okay. Thank you very much for that introduction. Can everybody hear me? Doing. I. I don't need a mic, right? Yeah. No. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you also to Bria, and thank you very much to Charles Small of ISCAP for inviting me here, and his wonderful assistant Gina Lorenz, who organized all the logistics. Um, I'm also very happy to be here because McGill is my alma mater and I haven't been in the Leacock building in about 30 years, 35. Wow. I don't want to date myself, but anyway, very emotional to be here and to have some family members here as well. Um, I'm going to start off today by showing you one and a half minutes of a film, uh, just to give you a flavor for the girls who are in the study. And um, this is partly because they're so wonderful and so beautiful, but also um, I found when I've presented on this research over the years that it's very often it's hard for people to actually picture what a 10 or 12 year old girl is like, what they think, um, how much they know, how much they understand. So we're just going to watch one and a half minutes. Um, I, won't, I won't tell you anything about it until you've seen it. I have a really good teacher this year, or tomorrow. It's really hard, but I like learning about things like that, even though um, some of it's really from a film that I made from the research, a 13-minute film, which if you want, you can view on my website, moragold.com. Um, and uh, it was, as you can see from, these fil from this film, the girls were about 12 years old. Some of them were highly articulate and had thought about some of these issues over the three years that I interviewed them. So I will tell you about the study. Um, and. Um, I'll first talk about the research, and as I'm speaking, try to sort of keep these girls in your mind to, so that it's a bit more concrete, some of what I'm telling you. Um, I'll talk for about 30 or 40 minutes at the most, because I, I'm very eager to have discussion with you. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, uh, for instance, about data collection or methodology. I want to give you an overview, and I want to discuss the findings, which are the most interesting part. 
And I'm also not going to cite all the references because there are a million references and it interrupts every sentence. It's really annoying. And if you want to read the whole paper, it was just published in the Journal for the Study of Antisemitism. Just came out. It's online. It's free. It's open, open access. Uh, it says it's December 2012, but it just came out. They just dated it the December 2012 issue. So. So as, as probably most of you know, um, anti-Semitism has existed for over 2,000 years. And since World War II, many scholars have sought to understand the phenomenon, uh, including its causes and effects. One area that has not been empirically explored, however, um, has been the effect of anti-Semitism on contemporary Jewish children. There are historical accounts and memoirs written about, for instance, uh, the effect of the Holocaust on Jewish children, memoirs written by survivors, for example. But there are no social studies, uh, research study, uh, sorry, no, no studies, research studies using social science research methods that document and analyze the experience of contemporary Jewish children. This is a significant lacuna, given that anti-Semitism is and has been for the past couple of decades on the rise around the world. This includes Canada, which has a long history of anti-Semitism. I don't, I'm going to uh, uh, say these things even though it, I imagine many of you already know these things, but it's a brief introduction. In 2008, a national survey found that about two-thirds of the religiously motivated hate crimes in Canada were committed against people of, quote, the Jewish faith that Judaism was the most commonly targeted religion, and that in 2008, the number of such crimes represented an increase of 42% over the previous year. Children are not immune to the violence that surrounds them, including ethnically-based violence, even when parents try to protect them. It's crucial then to try and understand the impact of contemporary anti-Semitism on Jewish children, both to address the gap in theoretical knowledge and to be able to help real Jewish children who are nowadays being confronted with this reality. So this research grew out of a previous research project that I had done. I conducted a national study of Canadian Jewish women and their experiences of anti-Semitism and sexism. And if you want, you can, you can read this also on my website. Uh, this study uh, used focus groups for the first phase of the study and afterwards a random sample of Canadian Jewish women from across the country. Um, and it demonstrated clearly the extent of anti-Semitism and sexism that Canadian Jewish women live with in their everyday lives. It also showed the mental health implications of these two kinds of oppression. The women in this study who reported having had many anti-Semitic experiences in the past had significantly higher scores on the Beck Depression inventory, but this did not happen for the women who had had a lot of sexism in their lives. We can talk about that later if that interests you. Another intriguing finding from the study was that when women were asked where these anti-Semitic experiences had occurred, the second most common place was at school. So at first I thought, okay, I had women in the study who were 18 to 72 years old. So I figured at first, okay, so this is the old women. These were things that happened in the 1950s. But in fact, I, it turned out that it was even the 18-year-olds who were saying this. Um, and it, it made me wonder whether present-day public schools were sites of anti-Semitism uh, for Canadian Jewish children. I consulted with colleagues. Uh, in anti-oppression work in several Canadian school boards, and they told me that actually it's definitely a problem in at least some of the schools. However, when I searched the literature, no research turned up at all on contemporary Jewish girls or boys' experiences of anti-Semitism. Therefore, I started this project. Uh, in terms of conceptual framework, um, like the Jewish women's study, this is grounded in Jewish feminist scholarship which focuses on the complex ways that the lives of Jewish women and Jewish girls are shaped by the dual oppression, quote, of anti-Semitism and sexism. This Jewish feminist work, of course, is part of the broader uh, feminist literature on dual oppression, such as sexism and racism and so forth. Um, since this study of Canadian Jewish girls was originally conceptualized as an outgrowth of the study on Canadian Jewish women, um, I wasn't, 
I included sexism, but the girls were not very interested in sexism. Sexism, And they were, at the age of 10 or 11, they said, this doesn't have very much to do with me. But they were very concerned about anti-Semitism. So basically, this study, which began as a study of sexism and anti-Semitism and the experience of Canadian Jewish girls, turned into a study of anti-Semitism. The objective, the overall objective, was to examine the psychological and emotional impact on these girls of these experiences, to qualitatively explore what these experiences were, and whether the psychological and emotional impact was related at all to any characteristics of the families or the girls. For example, were girls from orthodox homes having different responses to these kinds of events, or were they having different kinds of events than girls from non-Orthodox backgrounds? I also wanted to see if their experiences changed over a three-year period, um, as the girls matured cognitively, morally, intellectually, and so forth. So I used a longitudinal method where I interviewed the girls once a year over a three-year period. And in addition to the individual interview, we had focus groups once a year. For, there were 16 girls in all, so two groups of eight, because you can glean different kinds of information from a girl when you're meeting with her one-on-one -on -one than when you see her in a social context. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of how I found the girls. Um, that's a lot of detail there. Simply I'll say that I was looking for girls from all kinds of backgrounds, not just affiliated with the Jewish community, and they were found through schools, community centers, word of mouth, and so forth. Were there any from the Orthodox? No, no. And I actually had trouble um, getting Orthodox participation, um, and I wouldn't start the study till I did. Now, the definitions of Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox can be um, complicated. I don't think they'd say Hasidish, but one of the schools was Nativot HaTorah in Toronto, and the girls, I think some might say that it was more than just modern Orthodox, which would say be associated, but they weren't, they would not have identified in that way. I'm going to try to just go and leave you lots of time for questions at the end. Um, in the previous project, we found that Canadian Jewish women's experiences of anti-Semitism and or sexism were related to their socioeconomic backgrounds and to the amount and kind of Jewish education they had received. So what I did in the Jewish girls study was I made sure that half the participants were from Jewish day schools and half, namely eight, were from public schools. I also made sure that the sample as a whole re reflected economic, socioeconomic diversity and diversity in religious affiliation and the marital status of the parents. Uh, we also found in the women's study that there were no geographical differences in anti-Semitism across the provinces of Canada, which made me very happy because mo there are studies showing that Quebec is the worst and I found no difference at all, which made me very proud of my native town. Um, and so the research justified doing all of the research in one city, and of course, uh, I, of course I picked Toronto for reasons of convenience. What we did with each girl at the beginning um, was the parents filled out a demographic questionnaire with a lot of information, and I say that because you'll hear a little bit about that in the results. And the girls also filled out a questionnaire a very reputable psychological questionnaire called the CASQ, the Child Attribution Style Questionnaire, which me measures children's well-being and it takes about 10 minutes to complete. Um, after the girl had finished the CASQ at their first interview, each girl was shown a poster with seven topics on it and was asked to talk about these topics in any order she chose. And I'm not going to digress onto the difference between doing research with children and adults. It's very different. Uh, they all had a magic wand that they could use to wave at the topics. They had plasticine and dolls and lots of food. Of course, food's good for everybody, not just children, um, and so forth. I gave them a lot of control over the interview. But anyway, they talked about these seven topics, and when the girls were turning 11 or 12, I added the eighth topic of a bat mitzvah. Um, 
The reason I picked these topics was to learn as much as possible about their everyday lives, which is essential to understanding the context and meaning and impact of anti-Semitic events. You don't want to just have information about anti-Semitism. You want to understand the context. It's very important. Now, I didn't ask the girls explicitly about anti-Semitism because this is not a word that most 10 to 12-year-old children know, thank God. Um, instead, the girls were asked, how do you feel about being Jewish? What are some of the good things about it, if any? What are some of the bad things about it, if any? And I kept a poker face. I have a background as a therapist, so I try very hard to remain neutral when asking these questions. Has anything good or bad ever happened to you because you're Jewish? If so, what was it? How did you feel and react at the time? Now, if a girl mentioned an incident that seemed to her clearly anti-Semitic, she was asked why she thought that had happened or why she thought things like that happen in the world. Toward the end of each interview, the girls were also asked, if a 10 is a perfect life and zero is a terrible life, what number would you give your life right now? Then they were asked why they had given their life this particular numerical rating. This question was something that evolved in the interview in the, as I was doing the first year interviews. So in year one, only 12 out of the 16 girls were asked that question. Uh, also, I mentioned already that they were in, in focus groups, and um, the focus groups discussed the same seven or eight topics. At the end of the three years, uh, we analyzed the data from the interviews and focus groups using qual qualitative methods. Results. I made sure that rather than starting the, this little clip on the film with just anti-Semitism, I started with a girl talking about how she just loves Jewish studies. She just loves studying Talmud. It's so incredible. And there was a lot of that in these interviews. So to put into context what you're going to hear about anti-Semitism, please note that all the girls throughout all three years of the study felt that being Jewish was overall a positive experience. They all liked the Jewish holidays. The family get-togethers, they mentioned, the special foods. They mentioned, of course, presents. Uh, some of them liked going to synagogue or, quote, believing in God. And others enjoyed learning Jewish history or Jewish languages. One girl said that having Hebrew was like having a secret language. She loved being able to talk with her friends. Several girls felt that being Jewish was, quote, important to them, and it made them feel very proud. A few girls also said they liked being Jewish because they liked being different. Finally, a girl in year one of the study, which when she was 10 years old, indicated she liked Judaism because of monotheism, although, of course, she didn't yet know the word. This is what she said. I like being Jewish because you know that there's only one person out there who controls you. You don't have to worry about praising everything, like a God for this thing and a God for that thing. There's only one. I know I only have to trust one God. I thought that was so beautiful. Um, in terms of the negative aspects of being Jewish, other than anti-Semitism, which we'll talk about separately, participants identified four main categories. One, Jewish dietary restrictions. <laughs> Having to keep kosher, fast on fast days, eat special foods on Pesach. They especially hated Pesach food. <laughs> which some people can relate to even as adults, some can't. Uh, one girl admitted to cheating, quote, eating non-kosher food when she was away from her parents. And she made me promise not to tell. And of course, no, no one's identifiable by name here, so I didn't. Uh, number two, other religious prohibitions, not traveling on major Jewish holidays and therefore having to miss field trips and things like that from, for the girls who went to public school, not being able to pierce one's belly button because Judaism prohibits body piercing. This really upset one girl in particular. Uh, number, the third category is feeling singled out because of being the only Jew uh, or one of the only Jews in a class or in school, obviously, again, not in Jewish schools. And four, attending Hebrew school or synagogue, which are boring. And this was said by almost many, many girls. Um, the first and second items were issues only for the religiously traditional girls in the study. Number three pertained only to girls attending public school. And number four, being bored at synagogue or Hebrew school, was shared by girls from all types of schools and all religious backgrounds. Uh, experiences of anti-Semitism. The experiences of anti-Semitism that the girls in this study identified can be divided into two groups. One are the direct experiences, things that happened to them. And the <coughs> other are indirect experiences, which are things that happen to their relatives, to their friends, to their acquaintances, or even in the larger social environment. 
So I'll start with the direct experiences. Are you okay, the ones of you who are standing? Like, there's extra yeah, chairs. There's, 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 there's chairs here, yeah? Okay, okay, as long as you're okay. I, I'm just trying to avoid talking about these horrible things to tell you. Okay, direct experiences. In terms of these, uh, there were two direct incidents described by the girls in each of the first two years of the study and one incident in the third year, so that's five altogether, that these girls felt were anti-Semitic. And all five of these incidents took place in public schools. In year one, again at age 10, year, I won't keep saying that, year one is 10, year two they were 11, year three they were 12. In year one, a girl heard a group of her classmates saying that there was a book about Hitler that they'd heard of, and they all wanted to read because Hitler was, quote, cool. In the second incident, a girl's music teacher decided to teach the class a Jewish, in a public school, to teach the class a Jewish song for Hanukkah, but an Iranian girl told the class, I'm not allowed to do a Jewish song because Jews are my enemy. In year two, age 11, one girl heard a boy in her class tell the rest of the class, referring to her, pointing to her. I don't like her because she's Jewish. Another girl heard, quote, offensive comments at her school about Jews. In year three, a girl was sitting next to a classmate who drew a swastika on his hand and showed it to her, clearly intending to upset or offend her. Indirect experiences. Regarding indirect incidences, um, incidents, the girls in all three years reported events that they had heard about and experienced secondhand from relatives, friends, or acquaintances. They also had indirect experiences of anti-Semitism from the larger environment, but this sort of indirect experience was a major factor for these girls only in the first year of the research. And we'll talk specific, something very specific happened in year one. Um, well, what happened was there were three very, very dramatic anti-Semitic attacks in Toronto all in one weekend in March of that year. Within three days, the windows of a, of a synagogue were smashed, tombstones at a, tombstones at a Jewish cemetery were destroyed, and half a street in a Jewish neighborhood had its front doors spray painted with swastikas. The girls in this study were very affected by these events, and in the nine interviews that took place after this weekend, I did the interviews in the spring, so, so there were a bunch before and nine that took place right after this weekend, or in the weeks following this, these events, all of the girls brought up at least one of these incidents. Can you hear me in spite of that? Okay, okay so, so all nine girls, uh, of course, because you closed the window. So, uh, all nine girls uh, brought this up spontaneously, even the ones whose interview came five or six weeks later. Some of them also mentioned with concern the additional fallout from that weekend, for example, seeing anti-Semitic graffiti on the walls of the Jewish schools, their schools, and having to have guards posted there at the entrance doors. Two girls were very upset about the cemetery desecrations because their grandparents were buried at the cemetery that was vandalized. One, two of the grandparents were, as a little girl said, in the front row, uh, but fortunately none of the tombstones, their tombstones were broken. Two other girls knew um, people living on the street where the doors had been spray painted with swastikas. Uh, one was a relative, a cousin, one was a school friend. The second girl uh, was talking about her friend and she was too young to be certain about the word swastika. Of course, I was happy she didn't know the word swastika. Um, but she said her friend's house had been Suzuki'd. She tells you a lot about the background of some of these girls. It had been Suzuki'd, yeah. Uh, yeah. Another girl alluded to the high-profile murder two years before of an Orthodox Jewish man in a, by a skinhead on one of the main streets of a Jewish neighborhood in Toronto, and she said she was a little scared of what was happening now in Toronto. A fourth girl said she was worried about, quote, the pushing down of the Jew. Now, in contrast to year one, in year two of the study, there was no such dramatic anti-Semitic events, and none of the girls mentioned incidents of anti-Semitic vandalism in their interviews. But two girls still did describe disturbing indirect events. In one, a girl was told an anecdote by her Hebrew school teacher. Uh, we won't, I won't comment here on why this teacher told this story to a class of 11-year-olds. Um, this teacher's father's car had broken down and he had to call a towing company, so the tow truck arrives. And the, the, um, 
the driver asked her father if he wanted to stop somewhere on the way to his car for a coffee. And the guy said, no, thank you. No, I, I want to go straight to my car. So soon afterwards, the driver's phone rings, and it's his daughter. And he says to his daughter, I'm with this guy, and I asked if he wanted to stop at a coffee shop, but the Jew wouldn't buy me a coffee. Okay. So the teacher comes and tells her, her class this. In the second year two incident, a girl had a classmate, an Orthodox boy, who wore a kippah, yarmulke. One day he's riding on a bus, and a woman who was sitting down kept kip kicking him. He was standing, and you know she's sitting here, and he's standing here, and she keeps kicking him. Um, and he said to her, excuse me, you're kicking me. Would you please stop? And she didn't say anything. She kept kicking him. It was very crowded, and he tried to move away, but there wasn't, he couldn't move very much. Then the bus got to her stop, and she stood up, and she was trying to get off the bus, and she gave him a push, and she said to him, move away, Jew boy. This was a good friend of the girl in the study. In year three, also a year without any unusually dramatic <laughs> anti-Semitic events, eight girls described indirect incidents. One girl had a Hebrew teacher, and again, the Hebrew teacher told the class this, um, who worked part-time in the shul and answered the phone there. One day she picked up the phone, and it was an anti-Semitic hate call. Uh, the, uh, the woman on the other end of the line started screaming obscenities at her, including, you Jews are the fault of every death in the world. Um, another girl said she knew people who'd been insulted that year or made fun of because they were Jewish, for instance, being called a dirty Jew. A third girl was told a joke by a Jewish boy who had had it told to him. I, I'll just repeat it, it's revolting. Uh, what's the difference between a Jew and a pizza? Pizzas don't cry in the oven. She was freaked by that, needless to say. In year three, some of the girls also spoke about anti-Semitism in the larger environment. Uh, this is, of course, consistent with developmental changes in, these girls were undergoing at age 12, especially since many of them for that year were switching from elementary school to middle school. That's how they do it in Toronto. And were becoming more interested in and aware of the world around them. Uh, in year three, two girls brought up the anti-Semitic vandalism in Toronto two years before, one of them having seen it on the news. So they were already starting to watch the news and the internet and so forth. Two other girls read in the newspaper or heard from someone else about the Jews in Iran being forced to wear an identifying symbol on their clothing, quote, like a Jewish star. Another girl referred to how dangerous it was to be a Jew in Afghanistan nowadays because that's, that country is, quote, strongly anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitism, the Holocaust, and Israel. Now, in these interviews, I never brought up the, I never used the word Holocaust, not once. I never brought up Israel. And the girls brought up these two things over and over and over again. It was very, very dramatic to me. It happened extremely often and always spontaneously. In these girls' minds, there were clearly strong connections between anti-Semitism and the Holocaust, anti-Semitism in Israel, and the Holocaust and Israel, that whole triangle. Um, this happened more frequently as the girls grew older. In years one and two, a third of the girls related anti-Semitism to the Holocaust, but in year three, it was more than half. Similarly, rega regarding Israel, in years one and two, about a third of the girls related anti-Semitism to it in Israel, but in year three, this nearly doubled with about two-thirds of the girls, 64%, bringing up Israel spontaneously starting with anti-Semitism anti and the Holocaust, starting with year one. So in year one, one girl, after talking about the anti-Semitic vandalism in Toronto that weekend in March that I mentioned, said, it's like the Holocaust again. And two other girls expressed the same idea. One of these girls went on to say that the Holocaust scares her, quote, because I can't believe they did that and stuff, and like I could never survive and stuff. In year two, the girl who described the incident with the tow truck driver, after saying the Jew wouldn't buy me a coffee, she continued, which is sad. I was like sad that someone would say something like that, especially like after the Holocaust and like stuff. And also that guy, like the internet denied the, the Holocaust. I don't know who he is, but I heard it on the radio. Well, it's not as bad as that the incident of the tow truck isn't as bad as that, except it's still like, that's how it all started, you know. Well, like with people excluding Jews or like saying bad things about them one by one, and then it got bigger and bigger. 
and then the concentration camps. Similarly, in year three, the girl who related the story about the anti-Semitic phone call at the shul then began speaking about an anti-Semitic incident that had happened not long before in France, and then she went right into talking about the Holocaust. Wow, there's people in my area doing this. It's pretty scary. Like, if this were to ever happen again, like, which it could. Like, did you hear about the thing in France with the guy who got tortured? Like, these things are still happening, and if, if it comes back again, I don't know if we're going to be able to, like, deal with it anymore. So many of us are lost. Like, to think six million, you just, like, how could this many people be lost? Some of these girls seem to have been encouraged to think about the Holocaust by being given books to read about it by their teachers or parents. In year one of this study, only one girl mentioned reading a Holocaust book, but in years two and three, about a third of them referred to books they were reading about the Holocaust, usually for school, but also, not always, sometimes at home. We can talk about this after. I think it's a very important point. In addition, in years two and three, the girls alluded to other types of Holocaust-related educational experiences they had been exposed to. One saw a movie about it, one saw a play, and one was taken to visit a Holocaust museum. These girls were very affected by these experiences. They also seemed, as a result of them, to identify strongly with what happened to Jews during the Holocaust, and in some cases to especially identify, obviously, with the Jewish children in the Holocaust. For example, one girl in year three, age 12, spoke about pictures she saw at a Holocaust museum, including photographs of Nazis making people remove their clothes. She says, if they didn't strip, they'd be killed. She, she, this wasn't in... Anyway, obviously she was talking to me after coming back from the museum. If they didn't strip, they'd be killed. Or they, like, they tested with little boys, like five-year-old boys, to see how long they can go without food. And then, and it's just disgusting, like, what they did. And, like, to know all these people were Jewish, and they were, like, kids like me. Because of this identification, lighthearted comments these girls sometimes heard about the Holocaust, such as Hitler being cool or the joke about the pizza, were very painful to them. In all three years, there were some girls in the study who thought that the Holocaust could never happen again. However, others felt it definitely could because, quote, some people don't ever believe it happened. And even among those who do, quote, many haven't learned the lesson from it. Anti-Semitism and Israel. In terms of the connection between anti-Semitism and Israel, Israel was very, very much on the minds of the girls in this study. As with the Holocaust, as with the Holocaust they rep repeatedly brought up this subject spontaneously and unsolicited. In all three years, they recognized that the conflict in Israel was a political problem and a complex one. And different girls in the study actually had very different political opinions, uh, most likely rep reflecting their parents' views. Basically, though, the girls all saw that what was happening in Israel was a Jewish issue and related to anti-Semitism. This was their perception. I'm not, I'm not writing this. I'm, take, I'm taking this from the data. For instance, one girl in year one said that Israel keeps being bombed, quote, because it's the Jewish homeland. Another one offered, as, and this is amazing, for a 10-year-old, I think, actually. Another one offered as an example of anti-Semitism that Quote, a lot of people are having wars with the Jewish people, like in Israel. Many of the girls in the study were very worried about terrorist attacks in Israel. One girl had a friend who had been very close to a bomb that had exploded there. Two other girls heard of bombs going off in places in Tel Aviv where they had just been on holiday. Most of the girls felt quite attached to Israel. Six of them had close relatives, including siblings, living there. Several girls had visited Israel some numerous times. One girl in year two was going to spend the summer in sleepover <coughs> camp in Israel. Another girl was going to be having her bat mitzvah there. Because of all these personal, cultural, historical, and religious connections, any attack on Israel, physical or ideological, was experienced by these girls as attacks on them as Jews and therefore as anti-Semitic events. For example, in year two, one girl's sister who was a university student came home very upset because there had been an anti-Israel rally on her campus, which to this girl and her whole family was an anti-Semitic demonstration. Similarly, in year three, another girl heard from a friend of hers that one day she was strolling through a mall, a mall with her friend, and this friend was wearing a shirt, a t-shirt with the insignia of the, the Israel Defense Forces, the Israeli army on the front. Someone walking by them made a face 
and uh, a rude gesture towards her friend's shirt, like, ugh, that's disgusting. The girl in the study who heard this story was very, yes, she heard this story from a friend of hers. It didn't happen to her directly. The girl in the study who heard this story was very, very distressed and said that although she too has the same Israeli t-shirt, after this incident, she's not going to wear it anymore when she goes to the mall, quote, just in case. In year three, age 12, two girls in the study commenting on the political situation in Israel were clearly trying to view it with some objectivity and were obviously struggling with the competing claims of Jews and Palestinians for the land. For example, one girl said about the Palestinians, in their Bible, they kind of think that we're on their land. Like, they think it's their land given to them by their people, which it also says in ours, and they can't both be true. We think ours is right, but obviously from their point of view, they think theirs is right. Like, we think they're evil because they want to steal our land from us, but they probably think we're evil because we have their land and we won't give it back. Two other girls in year three commented on the role played by the Canadian media in influencing the way many Canadians regard Israel. For instance, you don't really hear about the good stuff that happens there. You only hear about the bad. In general, the girls in this study were very disturbed about the lack of peace in Israel. One girl, one girl in the first year, after talking about a terrorist attack, said, everything that's happening in Israel right now makes me really sad that so many people are dying and getting injured with, well, not really a reason, well, not a good reason, because it's just not right for someone to do such a thing, and people shouldn't like even think about doing stuff like that. And what my question would be is, why were weapons invented? Like, why were guns and bombs and stuff invented in the first place? Because right now, they're not coming to any good use. This view was also echoed by several other girls over the three years of the study. And in year two, two girls out of, the fifth, out of 15, there was attrition of one in the second year and one in the third, so 16 in the first year, then 15, then 14. In year two, two girls out of 15 gave their, li gave their lives lower ratings, an eight instead of a nine, and a seven and a half instead of an eight instead of a nine, because of the lack of peace in Israel. Now we're at the Holocaust and Israel, the last side of the triangle. With reference to this connection, and implicitly the three-way connection between anti-Semitism, the Holocaust, and Israel, with some of the girls, it was very noticeable how they switched seamlessly back and forth between these three topics. For example, one girl in year one talking about the Holocaust said, I don't think the Holocaust would happen now, except in Israel, and then went on to talk about the bombs going off there. Another girl in year one said she worries about anti-Semitism and what's happening to Jews around the world because, like in Israel, how there's like when there's like so many bombings and stuff, well, the Holocaust is obviously worse, but this is still really bad. A third girl referred to a Holocaust book she'd read where the girl in the story had had her parents taken away and people around her were getting shot. The girl in the study then said, and sometimes you hear on the news just like people who've done bad stuff to Israel, like if they want the land of Israel, they'll just go to war because they want the land. And then people just, and then people like they just war and then people die. Another way in which the Holocaust and Israel were connected conceptually for some of the girls was through the idea of historical anti-Semitism and the way Jews have often been unjustly blamed by the countries in which they've lived. One girl in year two said that she saw Israel as getting all the blame for the problems in that region, and then she continued. That's how World War II started, because Hitler um, convinced Germany that, like, Everything that's a problem that's wrong with the world is because of the Jews. Like the Russian president or something like that. Like he told his country, like he was like really bad. Like he took advantage. Like he, I'm, obviously this is the way, these were her words. Like he always took the money and everything. And when they would complain, he goes, it's all the Jews' fault. Everything that's bad is the Jews. The associations in these girls' minds between anti-Semitism, Israel, and the Holocaust were very striking. And I'll refer later on in this paper to the implications of this. 
the emotional and psychological impact of anti-Semitism on these girls. The direct and indirect anti-Semitic incidents described above had both emotional and psychological effects on, all these, on the girls in this study. In all three years, when the girls were recounting these anti-Semitic experiences, they also expressed feelings of fear and anxiety. And although most of them thought it unlikely that anything bad could happen to them in Canada because they were Jewish, some felt otherwise. In year one, for example, one girl said she could see something bad happening to her in Canada because she was Jewish. Another girl that year said that as a result of recent anti-Semitic events in Canada, she's now sometimes a little afraid of people who are not Jewish. A third girl, the one who had the incident with the Iranian girl, said she was, quote, sometimes really happy, but sometimes really sad that she's Jewish. In year two, after telling the story about the boy being kicked on the bus, this girl said that she was glad that, unlike Orthodox Jewish boys with their kippah, she is not identifiable as a Jew when she goes out in public. She thinks she is safer that way. That same year, another girl talking about her public school said, I don't point out that I'm like a Jewish person. If somebody doesn't ask me, I'm not going to tell everybody I'm Jewish. I don't fully make myself a contact. In year three, one girl talking about her public school said, sometimes I'm scared to tell people they're my religion because like you never know, like there could be people in the world who like are anti-Semitic. Two other psychological effects were noted as well. One girl in year one showed some evidence of internalized anti-Semitism. I wonder, she said, if I wasn't Jewish, would I make fun of Jewish people? I just wonder that. And in year two, Several weeks after her bat mitzvah, which was a very positive experience for her, joyous, and she was proud of it and everything else, one girl spoke about the possibility of converting to Christianity because of the dangers of anti-Semitism. Quote, sometimes I feel like I want to be Christian because I always hear about like this stuff about like people killing Jews because they're Jewish. I usually hear about it in Israel, but sometimes like near me, like Toronto, like, I think once I heard about this guy, he shot someone because he saw he was Jewish or something, and so he shot him. The following year, this girl repeated this idea, saying she could see herself converting at some point in the future, but not at this moment. When asked what sort of thing in the future might persuade her to convert, she answered, well, I know that there's been like some shootings or like in Toronto just because people are Jewish or like they've like put graffiti on some houses. That wouldn't make me convert, but it would make me persuade me a little bit, like maybe, just like for safety. In terms of the overall emotional or psychological well-being of the girls in the study, no relationships were found between their CASQ scores, the anti-Semitic experiences that they related, the types of schools they attended, or their families' religious affiliations. However, there was a relationship between the girls' experiences of anti-Semitism and the ratings they gave their lives, though only for year one. In year three, there was no such relationship, and in year two, this relationship showed itself only with two girls out of 15, those ones I mentioned who lowered their life scores because of the lack of peace in Israel. In year one, however, out of the 12 girls who were asked to rate their lives, five of them rated their lives lower than they would have otherwise because of anti-Semitism. This appears to be related to the weekend of anti-Semitic vandalism in March of that year because all five of these girls had interviews that fell after that weekend rather than before. These five girls came from both kinds of schools and all religious backgrounds and constituted 55% of the girls interviewed after that particular weekend. When asked the, re the reason for the lowered rating, one girl who had given her life an 8 instead of a 10 said, because I'm really happy with everything that's happening to me, but, pe but, but people for our culture, things aren't so good. Someone else who lowered her score said, because of what goes on to people who are Jewish. The fact that 5 out of 12 10-year-old ten ten girls in year 1 41% of the whole group rated the quality of their lives lower because of anti-Semitism, 
strikes me as disturbing. Given the well-established relationship between cognitive and emotional processes, it's important to understand how these girls not only felt about anti-Semitism, but also how they thought about it. All the girls in the study who described anti-Semitic incidents were asked why they thought that incident had occurred, or why things like that happen in the world. Below are some of their answers according to each year of the study. Year one, age 10. People think that the Jews are lesser people, that we're lesser people. Another girl. Because they have to blame their problems on someone, so they decided on the Jews. Another girl. Because being Jewish, there's always going to be hatred towards you. Another one. People are making out that being Jewish is something like it's a bad thing. Oh, I'll get some air in here. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's hot. Okay. People are making out that being Jewish is something like that's a bad thing, but there's nothing bad, it's just different. It's just believing different things. Another girl, because they hate Jews. But I don't know why they hate us. I don't think we did anything bad to hurt them. Another girl, I don't get why people would ever do that just because of a religion. Like, I don't think we're bad or mean or anything like that. Year two. There always is going to be anti-Semitism because some people just feel that way. Like some people feel that we should not be here. They don't like us. They're followers of Hitler. Another girl, I think they have their own problems and sometimes it's just them, like they may be sick. But sometimes it might be just like people who dislike Jews because of their own reasons. But I don't know what those are. One girl in year two expressed some self-doubt because of anti-Semitism and perhaps some self-blame. She said that when an anti-Semitic incident happens, she asks herself, is there something wrong with us? I asked her if she believed there is. Her answer was equivocal. I'm not really to say because I haven't learned all the history of our past, of our present. I'm not fully in contact about what's happening in Israel, what's going on everywhere, if we've done something to those people. So I don't think I can really like fully answer your question. In year three, the conceptualizations of anti-Semitism reflected these girls' increased intellectual maturity, for example, in the idea of stereotypes. Well, sometimes they, anti-Semites, have their own personal problems. I don't know what their problems would be, but pretty much all in all, they stereotype. They think that all Jews are bad, and it's like one Jewish person was mean to them. Like, they usually just stereotype one bad person. Another girl said, People just don't like people to be different, or they just stereotype, and they think that, let's say, all the Jewish people are mean or rich, or as I've heard, have big noses. Anti-Semitism and other forms of oppression. In year three, these girls' greater intellectual maturity and sophistication was also reflected in their understanding that anti-Semitism is just one form of hatred among many. In the first two years of this study, two girls each year showed evidence of this understanding, but by year three, this was manifested in almost half the girls. This ability to see the link between anti-Semitism and other kinds of oppression reflected increased maturity, not only intellectually, but also in terms of the girls' moral development. In year one, the two girls who connected anti-Semitism with racism attended the same Orthodox Jewish high school, uh, Orthodox Jewish elementary school, and there they, they've been shown a puppet show about black and Hispanic children getting stereotyped. One of the girls said that in that show, a white person told a black person that they were like lesser because they were black. It's so stupid because it's just a pigment. Then she drew a parallel between racism and ageism. I don't think anyone should be less treated. Well, I think that kids are less treated than adults. I have to say I agree with her there. <laughs> Very smart girls, I'm telling you. In year two, one girl connected the historical struggles of the Jews with the struggle of black people for their freedom and said it makes her angry whenever people, any people, quote, aren't treated the same. Another girl in year two talked about going with her class to see a performance by a group of people with disabilities. And in describing it, she related ableism to anti-Semitism and racism. In year three, one girl related anti-Semitism to racism, sexism, and homophobia, 12-year-old girl. Here's what she said. Discrimination makes me sad. 
discrimination against Jewish people and against women and against other people like Chinese people and black people and native people. And the way the Nazis and some of the Germans treated the Jews was just terrible. And that makes me sad and it makes me angry that people can treat other people that way. It doesn't really matter who you are, what your background is. They're just people. I mean, they're, we're all just people. We're all equal. I don't get how they could feel that they're higher than the gypsies and the Jews and the homosexuals. Similarly, another girl in year three speaking about the Holocaust connected it to racism, homophobia, and ableism. It's not just the Jews that were affected. Like a lot of other people were affected. Homosexuals were affected. Gypsies are affected. People with special needs are affected. So at the broadest level, these girls started talking about hate. This came up explicitly in year three in one of the focus groups where discussion took place of, among the girls. It was very interesting to see, since I knew the girls individually, to watch what happened in discussion. They were talking about the hate in the world in the focus group and what they could do to fight hate. One girl said, it's not possible to get rid of the hate in the world because, quote, even if there are just two people in a store, they're going to want the same item and they'll start fighting and sooner or later someone will say, I hate you. This was a 12-year-old understanding well, of conflict. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, sales. Another girl said that at school they were discussing to kill a mockingbird and how good things could be, quote, if everyone would just accept each other and if there was not hate in the world. Someone else mentioned that at school they were reading The Giver. And in that book, there's the idea of a pill that could make everyone love, love each other. In response, one girl said that to make the world perfect, someone would have to put a magic spell on everyone. You know, they're still girls. Quote, and then everyone would become nice and no one would hate anyone. Finally, one girl said, we need more love in the world, less hate. So, similarities and differences by religious background and type of school. We're coming to the end. And then it's time for you to talk. In this study, no differences at all were found between the girls from the various religious backgrounds. This is the case regarding the girls' anti-Semitic experiences, their life ratings, and their CASQ scores. This was very interesting because there were very large differences in lifestyle and worldview between, for example, the girls from Orthodox and Reform backgrounds. However, the similarities between them obviously outweighed the differences. With reference to the different types of schools attended, there were no differences between the girls on their indirect experiences of anti-Semitism, their CISQ scores, or their life ratings. However, it was only the girls from public schools throughout the three years of the study who had direct experiences of anti-Semitism, and I suppose one would expect that, or one would suspect that. The girls from Jewish schools may have direct experiences of anti-Semitism later in life, but for the time being, from a developmental perspective, their type of school is a protective factor for them, since according to the literature, the younger one is when exposed to environmental stressors, the more vulnerable one is. In terms of developmental similarities common to all the girls in the study, um, at the beginning of the research, when the girls were 10, their families acted as the main filter through which their information about and understanding of anti-Semitism was conveyed and interpreted. This parental centrality, of course, is typical of that age and developmental stage. At age 11, these girls' Hebrew school teachers also began playing a role in shaping their ideas about anti-Semitism. By age 12, however, these, as these girls approached adolescence and their general awareness of the world around them increased, they were influenced just as much on, uh, on this topic by peers, acquaintances, current events, the media, and the internet. Finally, one more similarity among all the girls in this study was that there was no relationship between their scores on the CASQ and the ratings they gave their own lives, or between the CASQ scores and their experiences of anti-Semitism. This was a bit surprising. We thought the girls who overall have well-being will rate their lives higher, but that wasn't the case. This may be because the CASQ focuses on general personality traits like optimism, and the question about life rating picked up probably on the girls' more transient feelings of the moment, so it might have been more sensitive to external events like an anti-Semitic incident. Discussion. This research was initiated out of concern for the well-being psychologically and emotionally of Jewish girls in Canadian public schools because of a previous study that implied this might be putting them at risk. 
The findings of this study indicate that to some extent this is the case. All five of the anti-Semitic incidents experienced directly by the girls in this study occurred in public schools. In addition, this research found that indirect incidents of anti-Semitism were experienced by girls from both public and Jewish schools. When discussing the incidents, the girls expressed worry, fear, anxiety, sadness, anger, and self-doubt. In addition, some of them responded to their anti-Semitic experiences by trying to hide their Jewishness, internalizing their anti-Semitism, or considering considering converting to Christianity. Over 40% in year one lowered their life satisfaction ratings because of anti-Semitism. All the above seems cause for some concern. Uh, so is the fact that as early as age 10, before most of these girls knew the word anti-Semitism, they were aware of and in varying degrees worried about this phenomenon. In that first year and in the two subsequent years, they were able to identify by name those countries where they had heard anti-Semitic incidents had occurred, such as Afghanistan, Iran, France, and Russia. And they also grasped with remarkable acuity that the essential characteristic of today's, quote, new anti-Semitism is anti-Israelism. As previously noted, these girls also repeatedly connected anti-Semitism with the Holocaust. This connection appeared to be encouraged by Jewish schools and by some of the parents, and although this focus on the Holocaust gave these girls some sense of Jewish history and identity, it also seemed to give them an increased sense of personal vulnerability. In addition, it was striking how, for some girls, the Holocaust was a barometer against which they measured their own experiences of anti-Semitism, e.g., the Holocaust is obviously worse, but this is still really bad. It gives one pause to think of 10 to 12 year old girls using the genocide of six million Jews as a frame of reference for analyzing their own lives. In terms of trying to understand what these anti-Semitic experiences really meant to these girls, it seems from these interviews that for them, Israel and the Holocaust were their two touchstones for anti-Semitism. The Holocaust on the one hand was anti-Semitism past and Israel with its struggles, anti-Semitism present and future. This may explain at least somewhat why two-fifths of the girls in year one were so affected by the weekend of vandalism that occurred and that they lowered their life scores. While it's true that in general community violence has a major impact on children, it's also possible that that particular weekend brought close to home for these girls both the violence in Israel and the violence of the Holocaust, since of course it was the swastika that got painted on the doors. This dual image, both aspects of it being about collective annihilation, past or potential, would have greatly intensified the psychological impact on these girls of that weekend's events. In terms of future research, which someone asked me about before, this project was just a first step toward understanding how Jewish girls and Jewish children in general experience and are psychologically affected by anti-Semitism. Additional research is absolutely necessary to build on this work. It's recommended that future studies compare the experiences of Jewish girls with those of Jewish boys, expand the size of the sample, and conduct an international project on Jewish children from many different countries, and employ, as this research did, both qualitative and quantitative methodologies, as well as a variety of different instruments to measure children's psychological resilience and well-being. It will also be valuable in future to compare the anti-Semitic experiences of Jewish children with the ways that non-Jewish children experience other forms of oppression, for example, racism. Finally, it is heartening to note that in spite of their experiences with anti-Semitism, all the girls in this sample, without exception, liked and or were proud of being Jewish. This is very important, and we as Jewish adults need to do whatever we can to help Jewish children build on the positive aspects of their Jewish identities, rather than inadvertently fostering negative Jewish identity by overemphasizing anti-Semitism in Jewish education or at home. It is challenging, to say the least, to put or keep anti-Semitism in realistic perspective when communicating about this topic with young people and to help them find a balance between denying and exaggerating this phenomenon. Research like this, however, has a crucial role to play in helping us to understand the external reality that surrounds us, the factors related to how Jewish children process this reality, 
and what we as scholars, parents, and educators can do to protect the next generation of Jewish children and at the same time prepare them for the future. Sure. When you analyze the backgrounds of the children, did you ask whether they were children of survivors or grandchildren of survivors? I didn't ask that at the outset. Uh, of course, I got to know the girls and their whole families very well. Um, in fact, there was one girl. Um, I usually did two interviews back to back, and I learned after the first year to always put one of the girls second, because not only did her mother not leave, she come. I was meeting alone with the girls. The mother would come to pick her up and wouldn't leave, just wouldn't leave. She talked and talked, and she always came with her sister or her mother, and her mother was a survivor. And there was a whole, I mean, it became really clear um, just, you know, the family's background became really clear. Uh, I know the backgrounds of the girls well, and I believe that was the only child from a family where a parent, a grandparent was a survivor. Okay, so first I will answer the question about were they the same girls in all three years. Yes, they were. This was a longitudinal study, which means that you follow the same group over time. Part of my interest in doing this and making the film, which I call Jewish Girl Power, um, was based on a film called Seven Up, yes. where every seven years a filmmaker in England and actually his Canadian colleague would film <coughs> British boys. And I sort of had this image of, and some girls too. But anyway, yes, this was the same girl, this was the same set of girls, and that was exactly the point that um, to really follow them and see how how their experiences and thinking about anti-Semitism evolved in the context of their lives and their experiences. So I got a much deeper set of data, I believe, uh, I know, than if it had been done another way. Um, as for the word Zionism, I'm a passionate Zionist. Um, and I'll tell, I, I want to say something about that afterwards in, in a different context. Um, I guess I was thinking in terms of pro-Israel, anti-Israel, uh, that's sort of my framework for thinking. But again, I wasn't using this language, any language, with the girls. I didn't even use the word Israel. In other words, in, in research of this kind, you really want to find out the language of the girls themselves. I never asked them about Zionism. Uh, one girl her parents were divorced and her father lived in Israel and she spent a lot of time there and she said, I'm a Zionist and, you know, and so forth. But it, it wasn't something that the girl said and what I'm doing here is sharing data. My own views uh, I can, would be happy to talk about after and they'll come out. You know, I have some further comments after. Um, the other question... Boys and girls. Uh, boys and girls. So as I explained uh, when I was talking about my theoretical framework and how this this study evolved, it was an outgrowth of a previous study. It was, it wasn't, I didn't sit down and say I want to do a research on Jewish children. What happened was I did a study of Canadian Jewish women and actually I did that research because I had a colleague who told me that I could not present at International Women's Day about Jewish women because Jewish women have had no experience of oppression. <laughs> and I said, I mean, we were Jewish both... Jewish husbands. Sorry? What about Jewish husbands? Uh, Jewish husbands, well, I don't know. But <laughs> that's, a separate, that's a separate research thing. Um, this was, we were both tenured faculty at the time. I said to her, can I give you something to read? And she said, I don't have time to read. A tenured professor doesn't have time to read. I said, um, can, I, um, can I come speak to your class? She said, there's no time in any of my classes. So I went to get an article to give her, which would parallel racism, sexism, and anti-Semitism, sexism, and I couldn't find one. And I said, okay, I'll do it. I actually didn't anticipate that the anti-Semitism was going to be a big thing. I was floored. I actually got very, very upset doing that research. I heard stuff. There was one time I came home, I was just in tears. I was listening to stories of hatred, and it, you know, 
I mean, it was a random sample from across the country. There was there were thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of data. Anyway, when I saw this thing about this finding that the second most common thing was that it, that it happened at schools and that it was still happening at schools, and my colleagues who wouldn't allow themselves to be quoted, who worked in anti-oppression in public schools, all right, I'll tell you, but don't quote me, um, that it's really hard to be a Jewish kid in a public school now, um, I said, all right, I'll do it. I'll do, a, I'll do this as a continuation. I did Jewish women, Canadian Jewish women. I'll do Toronto Jewish girls. I wouldn't want to generalize to all of Canada, although I suspect from what I hear anecdotally that much of it can be generalized. Um, as I said in the, you know, my conclusions about future research, obviously studies should be done with Jewish boys and Jewish girls using the exact, you know, a study using both and greatly expanded and so forth. Um, it would be very interesting to see what comes up. I'd like to just say another word about Zionism because it's, I'm an Israeli citizen having made Aliyah. I, I think my Zionism is a central, central piece of my life. And when I finished this research, I mean, I've been, I've helped to co-found three Canadian Zionist organizations and uh, most recently J Space Canada, but two others before that. And after, at one point, I decided that um, in addition to doing political activism, because one obvious question that, that just, you know, you listen to this and you go, what can we do about it? What became obvious to me was that um, we, have to be, we have to be using more diverse tools to, to get our point across. I'm a fiction writer. I finished a novel called Fields of Exile, which is about... Um, anti-Israelism on a fict fictional Canadian campus. And I'm happy to say, which not even my family members know, I have a publisher for it. Yes! And um, it'll be coming out in a year, and it will be the first novel about anti-Israelism on campus anywhere. And I certainly one has to be very careful not to make a novel. It's not a diatribe, it's a novel. It's a literary work. But I think through the arts you can reach people. Um, in a way that you can't through anything else. And um, I also edit, just for your pleasure, this isn't directly related, but indirectly related. I edit, I founded and edit an online literary journal called JewishFiction.net. Um, and you can just watch it. Um, we have famous writers uh, from around the world, 11 languages in origin. Anyway, new issues out on Thursday, but JewishFiction.net. Just enjoy it for fun. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm sure you must have thought about it. Any chance you might do a similar study with Israeli girls who are exposed to terror attacks to stop throwing and this and that? Yeah, yeah. There's a lot being done. Actually, yeah. there's a lot of research in Israel on the effects of um, Intifada 1, Intifada 2, and post-Intifada, I mean, on life. Uh, one very interesting set of studies is being done by two, was being done, I think it was completed, um, a study comparing the effects of the problems in Israel on Jewish and Palestinian children in Israel by two social work professors, one Jewish, one Palestinian, both at, Pal at um, University of Haifa. I think it's really important to put this kind of work in context. I'm a proud Jew. I'm this is, Jews are my people, but we're part of a world, and this is, you know, hatred is about hatred, and the more parallels you draw and the more alliances we build, um, the better for all of us. I, I really think one has to understand anti-Semitism in that context. I have a, a friend and colleague who is doing, I think he does child welfare research in about I think he's up to about 15 countries. He's an amazing sort of world expert on children. And last week he and I spoke about any way you could sort of sneak in a question. But we, we sort of play with that idea, and I would love it if at some point he would try and do uh, cross-country comparisons, tying it in with other kinds of um, psychological and emotional problems with children, forms of abuse and so forth. His field is abusive. Well, uh, there is research on... There's all sorts of research on Holocaust survivors and on the second generation, on the children of Holocaust survivors. Um, but you, you're touching on a really important point, and I'll only, 
I'll put out my opinion here, which is just my opinion, and obviously there are many opinions on this point. Um, I hold in, in really high esteem, I would almost say reverence, uh, Jewish educators and Jewish teachers who spend their lives trying to convey, to pass on to the next generation a sense of Jewish identity. Some, however, I find, use the Holocaust in a way that I consider problematic. Um, I think it's really important that the Holocaust is taught to children with a very sensitive awareness of what children are like developmentally. So for example, and actually I gave this talk once and the late Paula Hyman, the late great Jewish historian, she died last year, she was at Yale, she was a brilliant, brilliant historian. And um, after I spoke, she jumped up, she said, no one agrees with me except you, like thank God you said that. Um, Basically, children who are, for example, eight years old in grade three, who are read a story, a vivid Holocaust story, quote, for children, come home, and Paula said this happened to her daughter, and I know other people it's happened to, they come home, and because at age eight, you're just, I mean, you read your Piaget, you're only just beginning to really get a sense cognitively uh, of time and place and, and what's real and where the boundaries are. The average seven or eight year old will come home and think that it happened next door. They don't understand what it means 75 years ago, across an ocean, it is nothing short of traumatic. And now some Jewish educators who insist on teaching this material really young and the more shocking the better, it's instant Jewish identity and they'll defend it that way. They have to know their heritage. They don't have to know it's seven o'clock at, sorry, at, at, at age seven, that people were, ba you know, experiments were done and, and, and people were gassed and children like, I'm sorry, you know, would you do that to a child? Would you take a child uh, downtown to watch, to see the body of somebody who had been raped and murdered? Of course not, but the, anyway, I don't want to, yeah. you know, perseverate on the point. The I'll, I'll just finish, yeah. I'll, I'll just finish the point. Yeah. I think there's, it's so, his, Holocaust education is so important, and it's a crucial, crucial part of our history. And I think there are wonderful ways to teach it, and people who teach it wonderfully. And I'm just saying, I'm just cautioning. Like when I talk to some of these girls, and they and their mothers, and some of the mothers were furious. She came home crying for weeks. She didn't sleep for weeks. That's what I'm reacting to. Um, I obviously think it's essential part of Jewish education. Well, yes. I'm just wondering, when I was 10 years old, I had no idea what great meant. Yeah. You know, and I think, um, you know, analogously, um, yes, of course, Holocaust education is so important. And of course, you know, yes, you do need to teach the full extent. However, I mean, if you wait, I mean, you wouldn't teach kids, like, uh, you know, an eight-year-old eight -year kid about what rape is, you mm -hmm. know? You, just, just because you wait a couple extra years does not mean that they're never going to learn about it. You know, a, yeah. I, we had a Holocaust student in grade six, you know, at my mm -hmm. Jewish elementary school. It was perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, we were able to understand it. That's an they excellent to, age. They were able to, to, to deal with the shock factor and et cetera, et cetera. However, in grade three, um, I had a teacher, which for you know, showed this, this, this video about, you know, all these little kids our age that died in the Holocaust and like really shocking and whatever, and the kids were crying and it was really traumatic. And, I just think, I don't think that was a very wise thing to do, you know, like I said, you wouldn't talk about, you know, the birds and the bees with someone, with, with an eight-year-old, and why would you talk about the Holocaust, you know, but you would still talk about it with them, like, when they're four, 12, 13, 14, and they'll, they're old enough to understand it, they're old enough to conceptualize it, and they'll still have this essential knowledge, so, you know, that's how I think. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, be beautifully said, thank you. Uh, question the other times. This was how I took into account uh, myself, my presence, and how I may have inadvertently biased questions, and being a Jewish woman myself. I had never done longitudinal research before, and I'd never done research with children before, and it's really different. It's so intimate. You have a 10-year-old who's I don't know if you remember how small 10-year-olds are. Like, they're really little, and they're scared, and their mother you know, standing in the doorway and go in, honey, it's okay. And I've offered her a cookie and chatted her up a bit, but basically she's sitting here like this, like she's in school and she's really scared, you know. And I, one can, I guess one can help, but I couldn't help feeling great affection for each and every one of these girls. 
And basically, they were opening up their hearts to me. I mean, eight-year-old, ten-year-olds have no defenses. I mean, they have defenses, but you know, you ask them, you know, how many brothers and sisters do you have? What, you know, do you basically? I don't like my brother, or my mother, and father had a fight last night. They tell you everything, and and I never repeat any. Of course, you know, and I. So uh, over three years, a, a real relationship evolves, and. Um, uh, there was no way to not have that relationship. Um, one girl actually mentioned in one of the interviews, I, said, I asked her the usual questions, because every year it was the same set of questions. So I, I, before we sat down, you're going to ask me if I've had any anti if, if anything, how I feel about being Jewish. She's like, God, is it bad? Did anything bad happen? <laughs> She's like, because they're bright girls. They remembered, you know. And so I'm sure that participating in this research um, got them thinking. You know, they knew if something happened, I'll save it up for Nora. I also <laughs> sent them happy Hanukkah cards. You know, I'd see them in the spring. I'd send a card at Hanukkah. I'd see them again. I'd sometimes bump into them, I mean, in the Jewish community somewhere. Um, I never, you know, as I said, I have various hats, uh, including having been a therapist. So I, I know how to not reinforce certain responses, and I know how to not ask leading questions. You know, when I'd say, so, you know, how is school this year? And they, she'd pour out her heart uh, about she hates her new school, she has no friends. I mean, we were, we were, they were talking. I wasn't talking, basically, very much. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the girls had real problems, and for me, there was an ethical question about what my responsibility was in those situations. Um, where did I draw the line between the role of researcher and social worker or therapist? There was one case in which I called the mother to let her know, and I got the daughter's permission, that the daughter's score was just really worrying on two of the tests, because we also did the, the, um, we did the CASQ that something seems to be really troubling her. I didn't tell her anything the girl had told me. And I said if she wanted to um, take the girl to talk to someone, that might be a good idea. It's the family's decision. Um, I mean, it's very moving. You know, the part of me that's a writer was just sitting. I mean, each, each girl was a whole world. The part of me wanted to sit down and, and write a novel about each girl. Just watching really how you know, a girl switches schools and she goes from being confident and doing, you know, her whole life falls apart. One girl who was absolutely bullied at school and at home for years, just from one year to the next, physically developed very quickly. Suddenly she's the most popular girl in the class, bursting with confidence. Maybe it was skin deep, but she was, I almost didn't recognize her. Um, she went from having no friends to being sought after in the focus group. Everyone wanted her. Um, we didn't have email addresses, and it wasn't Facebook. It was something, something else they wanted. I don't remember. I don't remember. Yeah, I think it was MSN. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, but anyway, um, I think all my years as a therapist made me very sensitive to, very aware, and also, I mean, this was feminist research, and it that was complex too, because in feminist research, um, it's a matter of, of theory and practice that you lower the boundaries. You know, in feminist therapy with adults, for example, you would say, you know, I too am a woman. I understand what you're describing. Obviously, I wasn't going to lay anything like that on the girls. I never talked about myself. Uh, once a girl said, you know, Sometimes I feel so lonely. Have you ever felt lonely? And I said, everyone feels lonely sometimes, you know. But no, this wasn't my time or space. This was, the camera was on them, you know, and everything. They're hot everywhere. The question was, she'd like to hear a bit more about my book. Um, I've been very involved in the issue of anti-Israelism on campus. Um, I was a professor, tenured professor for 10 years at McMaster. Uh, this was... Eight, uh, 90 to 2000, and it was a different world then, and it wasn't at McMaster per se. Everything really was starting, you know, by the time I left. But I guess because I'm Israeli citizen as well as Canadian, I have a real nose for anything to do with Israel. And I, I saw a lot of this stuff way before 
I don't say this to pat myself on the back. I saw it before other people and wasn't below. Other Jews would say, nah, 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 nah. And then it started to become sort of undeniable. Um, the book, the main character of the book is a, stu a female student about your age, who um, I told it from a student's perspective, a uh, left-wing Zionist, uh, my politics, uh, progressive Zionist, I think we have to say nowadays since the word the phrase left wing has become tainted. Uh, used to be a wonderful word, but anyway. Um, and uh, she's gone to live in Israel. She's, she's passionate Zionist. She's part of the peace camp there. She's part of a project where uh, she brings together with others Jewish and Palestinian students. And she, she's, anyway, uh, she comes back to Canada because her father's dying. Her mother's dead, she's an only child, and there's no one to take care of her father except her. And she basically comes back to Toronto to take care of her father. And when he dies on his deathbed, he says to her, she sort of thought he had some money because he had a little store. Turns out he didn't have any money. He said, I'm sorry, I, don't ha I haven't left you provided for as I'd hoped. And I have a request to make. And her parents had been trying to get her to come back from Israel every time she'd come home to visit. And she'd always said, no, no, no. But this was a deathbed request. And um, he said, I want you to stay for a year and get an MSW so you can, quote, stand on your own two feet. Because she was alone in the world, Elaine in the Welt. You know, she didn't have, meaning she didn't have a man to take care of her. And, um, and she'd had these really crappy jobs like, you know, in Israel, just a volunteer on kibbutz. She had no money or anything. Never had a full-time job except on contract basis. So anyway, she agrees. She says, I'll stay and get my degree. And he dies, and she stays for one year. And she wants to quit, but she can't because she promised. She's very precise. She didn't promise to try. She promised to get her degree. And so she's trapped. And... Um, She's smart. She is picked up very quickly. She's very well liked by the students and the faculty. And her favorite teacher invites her to co-chair the anti-oppression committee, <laughs> which she thinks is great. They all think she's great because she's a good Jew because she, you know, she's progressive like them, um, not like those other kinds of Jews. And all of these things start coming out. And she, I won't give away the plot. But basically, um, they're planning anti-oppression day on the committee. And she, because she has so much homework, forgets to look up the guy they're going to bring. You know, she has other things to do. And at the, the final meeting, um, you know, before it's in February, and uh, the, there's the meeting in January, she finds out who the guy is. And he's the guy who's responsible for a fictitious event called the Back of School Children bombing where they bombed school buses, and he orchestrated it. And he's going to be the human rights speaker for Anti-Oppression Day. He's going to get the Dunhill, is the name of the fictitious university, which she calls Dunhill, the Dunhill Human Rights Award. And she says, you can't do that. This isn't someone who's fighting for Palestinian self-determination, which I support. He's someone who has declared publicly that not only are Israeli military targets you know, acceptable, but Jewish civilians around the world, including children. This is, he's a murderer. Anyway, she's outvoted. And, and it goes on from there. So that gives you some flavor. Okay, so I'm curious to hear, I know this is kind of going off of your research, but um, based on the fact that um, all of the direct um, uh, experiences of anti-Semitism happened within a public school system, um, I'm just wondering, like, yeah, I guess, like, where where you sit with that idea of, like, public school system versus um, Jewish schooling, um, and, like, yeah, how do you see that in public school? Like, is that just kids being kids? Mm -hmm. um, like, you, do you mm -hmm. actually, yeah. That's a really good question about sort of the pros and cons mm -hmm. of public school versus Jewish school, and mm -hmm. is that sort of it? I mean, as I said, you know, the research on children shows that you're more vulnerable the younger you are, to summarize a complex, you know, voluminous body of research very, very succinctly and simply. So, you know, if you're going to encounter anti-Semitism, better you're 12 than you're, than you're 8, so to speak. 
Um, I think there are pros and cons to both, and I certainly don't come down on saying, you know, public schools are bad. Not at all. I mean, it's the real world. Some, some people think that it sort of toughens you up, you know, uh, gives you skills to deal with. I see, and I see, again, not to be negative, my son, just to put this in context, my son went through the whole Jewish school system in Toronto, elementary, high school, etc. Uh, and that was a very important thing for both me and my husband, so don't get the wrong impression. Uh, he had some fabulous teachers who, who changed his life and so forth for the, for the better. For the, you know, well, <laughs> but, um, but there, there are dangers in Jewish schools too. He, he had teachers who would, you know, basically say it's us and them. You know, they're really, you know, you... We all know what we're talking about. Who really almost cultivated a fear of non-Jews in the children, which drove me crazy. I mean, yeah. I would say that in elementary school, there were times he'd come home, and basically, I would set aside almost 20 minutes to to deconstruct what he'd been taught. A uh, tremendous amount of sexism, I must say. You know, the one girl wanted to wear a kippa. Why do you think you're a boy? I mean, like stuff like that, which didn't sit well well with me. But that's a whole other topic. Um, you know, I think certainly when you're talking about young children, parents are the crucial, obviously the crucial factor. And, and parents really, you know, need, good parents are, or should be, really on top of what the, teach, the school's teaching. And, you know, certainly, I mean, I guess that's it in a nutshell. Just to summarize for the camera, I guess, what she was talking about how children in Israel are sometimes taught hatred against Palestinians and so forth. And yes. She's not defending that. And, you know, I don't think you or any of us are going to judge what it's like growing up. I mean, I think, you know, again, my, my perspective on all this is that there are, real there are real parallels. I'm not saying, e I'm not saying equivalences and I'm not going to go there, but I'm saying if you look at a group of Palestinian children and what they think about Jewish children in Israel and you yeah. take a group of Jewish children, there's, there's a certain symmetry in the other is the enemy. And I have to say on a, on a personal note, and of course I, not of course, but I really don't judge, but you know, I lived in Israel for six years and I go back two or three times a year and I have a whole other world there, very close friends whose politics are like mine and I've heard things come out of some of their kids' mouth that has left me literally speechless. I mean horrible things. I know exactly what you're referring to. And um, I know actually some people in Israel who are putting together program I mean there are programs to teach Israeli youth about democracy and respect and coexistence mm -hmm. needed now more than ever um, because hopefully that will be the future some sort of coexistence are we also teaching the Palestinians